Family, I love you so much and thank you for your continual support of my presbyters. And good to see Apostle Gloria holding all the way from New Orleans. Love you and so glad that you are here. Tonight, we all have been instructed to teach on leadership. And as I sought the Lord and thought about our theme, the Lord has instructed me to share on trumpet leadership. Trumpet leadership. The church at Thessalonica is an important one to study for several reasons as it pertains to our theme of what we can do for the kingdom. Thessalonica was one of the most essential capital cities in Macedonia, or another way to call Macedonia would be Greece. So when God sent Paul there on his second missionary journey to preach in the synagogue of the Jews, it was an indication of God's providence to fulfill the words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that witnesses of him would extend to the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul and Silas preached there for three weeks and from this ministry a large new vibrant faith community at Ecclesia was birthed of diasporic Jews and mostly Grecian Gentiles and several leading women. Acts chapter 17, which chronicles the birth of the church at Thessalonica, also reveals that the Apostle Paul's time there was very brief due to persecution. And as a result, he had to flee and run to Berea. That's found in Acts chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. These recent converts who have been called from idolatry into Christ were left with little external support in the midst of persecution, yet this church remained intact and began to grow in such a way that it gained the attention of churches abroad. In our text tonight, Paul has written this letter to the church he started to encourage them that despite the persecution, to go on working for the kingdom quietly while eagerly waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is interesting to note here, brothers and sisters, however, despite the short time that he had with them and the persecution that they were facing, this church has set a standard for all other churches. In verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says that the word of the Lord had sounded forth in every place. The word there sounded forth comes from the Greek word that means the blast that comes from a trumpet. That the word of the Lord in Thessalonica was so clear, so strong, and so powerful that it blasted out like a trumpet. It was symbolic of the fact that the word of what God was doing at Thessalonica was so strong and so amazing that God would take Paul and Silas and take them to such a heathen place. And just in a short period of time, God would birth such a dynamic church. There was a trumpet sound similar to the trump that Paul later writes in his second letter to the church at Thessalonica. That trump sound when the Lord Jesus returns to rapture the church. Uh, how many of you know that you're going to be raptured? If you're dead, you're going to be called up out of the grave. Uh, and those that remain shall be called up. I wish I had some saints. I know I'm teaching. Ah, but when I think about the return of Jesus, it does something to my spirit. When, when I saw this in the research... It begged a question of what was it that Paul said or what did he do to cause these people to thrive in persecution? What did he say or do that caused him to thrive with little direct instruction and support from him to become a church that the word of the Lord would sound forth in every place? One thing for sure is that when Paul and Silas came to Thessalonica, they brought the gospel under a full, full operation. They brought the word, they brought the power in that word there, its authority, its zeusia, and they came in the Holy Ghost, and they came in much assurance. And we as leaders must remember that when we get up to bring forth the gospel, we're not just bumping our gums. We're not talking out the side of our neck. But we're getting up and we're bringing the word of God. These 66 books which has been canonized for us to teach to the people of God. 
When we get up, we get up with authority. We don't get up wondering and questioning what gives us the ability to speak the word. We know that God called us. Uh, he called us from our mother's belly. And he has obtained us to do. Ah, I wish I had some help. I'm not talking to leaders. You're looking around. Some of you are thinking about after church. Come on, bring your mind back here. Listen to what I'm saying. You've been called with a holy calling. And that gives you the authority. And the Holy Ghost gives you the power to stand and to teach the word and to declare what thus says the Lord. But we don't teach the word to tear down. We teach the word to build up. We give the people assurance uh, that despite what you're going through, there is hope. Uh, that despite your financial situation, uh, there is a breakthrough. Despite your medical report, uh, God is still in the healing business. There is assurance uh, when we stand behind the sacredness that we have to give the people. Now this was vital to them, the people at Thessalonica, making the decision to follow Paul and Silas into the Christian faith. But the question still remains, what was it that caused them to become examples to the point that their faith towards God had gone out ahead of the apostles to the point that the apostles did not have to talk about Thessalonica. The people were telling them about Thessalonica. Is your leadership so strong that you don't have to talk about what God is doing in your church? You don't have to talk about what God is doing in your ministry. It's already sounding out from your ministry. And when you see people, I hear what God is doing in your church. They didn't have to speak about the word. They were speaking from themselves to the place where the word of God was like a trumpet inside, resonating from Thessalonica. Perhaps the answer can be found in one of the themes of Paul's letter to this church. The letter is very eschatological in nature. Eschatology simply means the study of end times. The study of end times. Now usually when we discuss end times, we're talking about dread and the rapture and Armageddon. Think about it. When people are talking about end time prophecy, they're only talking about that stuff. And that's a part of it. But there is an important aspect of eschatology that Paul taught at Thessalonica. And that was the return, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus. The advent of Jesus coming back for his church. It was clear that Paul and Silas released something in Thessalonica that set the people on fire for the Lord's return. Can I submit to you tonight that one of the reasons why several churches have lost their zeal, has lost their influence, has lost their power, is because they have lost their expectation for the return of Jesus. And let me tell you, most churches are not even teaching that anymore. When I was growing up, they taught us, you better live right because Jesus is coming back any day. Don't let him find you with your house undone, with your work undone. Because he can come, he can crack the sky at any moment. And if he crack the sky, will you be ready? And they lived under this mentality. That any day, he could come back. Yes, it must be acknowledged that one of the, early, one of the reasons why the early church has so much power. Why they operated under a heavy presence of the Holy Spirit. Why they experienced exponential church growth. And one day Peter stood up and asked to and preach. And 3,000 people joined the church. Why is it that the apostles could walk down the street. And they could line the sick up. And they didn't have to lay hands on anybody. But their shadow, you're not talking to me. Would bring healing and deliverance. And demons would flee at the presence of the apostles. Why is it? That that was then. We think, well, that was then and this is now. No, the Bible says greater works. Why is it that the church of the 21st century is not operating in the greater works? Because we're not living in this dialectical tension between expecting the return of Jesus at any moment. And because we, we expect him to come at any moment, we are busy living right and working for the kingdom diligently every day the early saints did not want their master to come back and their work was undone so they were not walking around asking the kingdom what the kingdom could do for them they were busy operating in their purpose and gifts because they wanted to do what God called them to do because they didn't know when God was coming and the byproduct of being busy doing the work of God 
was that every need was met in abundance in the church and in the individual life. It wasn't just prosperity in the church, but everybody that was a part of the church was prospering and flowing in the things of God. I call this type of leadership trumpet leadership. Paul and Silas demonstrated and replicated trumpet leadership at Thessalonica. Trumpet leadership is one that imparts an eager anticipation for the trump or the return of the Lord in the hearts and the spirit of believers. This then drives them to use their gifts and work for God diligently, not in fear of his return, but in excitement. So when we teach the return of the Lord, we're not teaching it in fear. We're teaching it in excitement. I know when I was growing up, the old saints used to be excited about Jesus coming back. But the 21st century church don't want him to come back. Because we enjoy living. We want to live and we want to have our things. But when you really are sold out to God, there's something in your spirit that says not only come back, but it says hasten, Lord, which means hurry up and come. You can come today. I'm ready to go be with Jesus. And we need a church that loves Jesus more than things. That loves Jesus more than positions. That loves Jesus more than possessions. That loves him so much that if he came right now, I'll be ready to go beat him in the air. So we got to get back to putting that in the hearts of the people. Jesus is coming any day. So get busy working. And as a result, the Holy Spirit manifests and amplifies the word of God in that place. And the word of the Lord then trumpets or sounds out to others due to the works and deeds of the believers. This corporate sound or this trumpet sound that causes the work of the leaders to be easy. Because they do not have to promote their own stuff. The people promote the work. You know why some of us are struggling in our ministries? Because you're trying to promote your ministry. Versus putting a sound in your people to promote your ministry. Oh, you can look at me crazy if you want. I love you enough to tell you the truth. That if you take yourself out of the equation and put the Lord Jesus return in the equation and put it in the hearts of the people, they'll grow your church for you. As leaders, we need to ask God to put the sound and the passion for the return of Jesus in us. See, the problem is, it's not in the people because it's not in us. Oh, can I say that again? I wish I had 50 people that really love Jesus and can take a little hit right here. The reason why it's not in the people is because it's not in us. We are not anticipating the return of Jesus. And we need to ask God, is it in us for real? Or are we pretending? Are we really expecting his return? Are we going through the motions? That's wishing and hoping that this strategy and this principle and this person will help our ministry to grow and help our people to develop. No, 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 no. If we first get a desire for Jesus to come back and get busy doing what he called us to do with passion and fervor, not lazy and not half, come on, giving it all you got. Then the people will get it inside of them. And they'll begin to do the work. They'll begin to teach. And they'll begin to sing. And they'll begin to clean the church. And they'll go lay hands on people. What oh, they'll do it if you will get it in you fight. We got to get in us first. And in order to do that as leaders, we have to move ourselves out of the way. Most of us are in our own way. We have to become what Jim Collins calls in his book, Good to Great, a great book to read. Level five leaders who have extreme humility, yet resilient will. Meaning, it's not about your personality. We're not going to grow our churches because we're great preachers. We're not going to grow our churches because we're great strategicians. We grow our churches because we preach Jesus and then he's coming again. We have to become leaders like Tom Rayner describes in his book, The Breakout Church, an Acts 6 7 leader, a legendary leader, a person who cares more about the work of God than themselves. And they will sacrifice themselves if need be to make sure that the church will continue years after they're gone. 
Are you doing things now in your leadership that will make sure it will continue after you're gone? Or are you setting it up so it falls when you leave so all the people do is reflect on you?